It's going to be uh, quite a big Friday morning, uh, I, I imagine. What? She's 42. Thank you. Um, and we've got a lot to cover um, after, well, the shock, but not for some and certainly not for one of our guests who wrote about the possibility of the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, re resigning back in October last year. But we're going to pick through what happened, why it happened, and I think we can reliably assume we are not getting the full story. This wasn't uh, the case of a Christmas holiday break gone wrong and someone feeling a little tired and saying, I'll throw it in. This is the Prime Ministership here, folks. This is uh, five and a half years for Jacinda Ardern of being an international superstar, being not universally but loved and fated by at every woke dinner party in New Zealand. Um, and suddenly she says, no, I'm out of here. It's gone, it's over. Something else has been going on. There have been other tensions. Um, and also, of course, right now, history begins to write Jacinda Ardern's prime ministership into its pages and uh, much debate, speculation, controversy over who she was, how she ruled, what she represented. I thought the best person to start with today was someone who would have some context and perspective uh, on prime ministers and particularly on the left of politics and, and the Labour Party. So I'm very pleased we're going to get straight into it to welcome uh, to the platform this morning uh, political commentator, some would say an out in the wilderness now lefty, uh, Chris Trotter. Chris, lovely to have you with us. Thank you for, for coming on in this morning. It's my pleasure, uh, Sean. All right. Were you shocked yesterday? I was. Uh, you could have knocked me down with a feather because... She had been, that is, the Prime Minister had been so adamant that this was not what she was going to do. People had uh, put this question to her numerous times, and every time she had said, nope, nope, that's not me, I'm going to fight this to the end of the year, and hopefully, as Prime Minister, um, soldier on uh, into the future. But as you say, something has happened, uh, and it will be very interesting uh, over the years ahead to finally discover, as we always do, we journalists, Sean, yep. um, or historians, just what it was that brought this to Because this wasn't a wet holiday, feeling a bit down, oh, I think I'll go and do something else, was it? It's not what the Prime Minister says it is. Well, certainly to give up... Um, Political power is an unusual uh, thing for a politician to do, uh, especially uh, in an election year uh, where her presence at the head of the government is regarded by many or was regarded by many as crucial uh, because, as you say, although she has her enemies, she has a great many friends as well and... She has that star quality, albeit somewhat dimmed from the early days of Jacinda Mania. But looking at those who are now being spoken of as her successor, I think it's clear that uh, whoever that is will, will not have the luster of Jacinda Ardern. Mm. Uh, yeah, Chris, I, th I think that's an in interesting point you make. Is there anyone who could replace her? If this was a tactical move by the Labour caucus to ease her out, I, I thought about this last night. There is no one else sitting waiting in the wings of all the candidates that are being talked about now that I think could have got more votes than Jacinda Ardern under whatever circumstances come October the 14th. She was still the best bet for the Labour Party at the 2023 election, wasn't she? Yes, she was. And you're quite right. Uh, there is nobody like her waiting in the wings uh, because that was the great blessing she bestowed upon, upon the hapless... Um, uh, oh, his name uh, escapes me. Our current Minister of Health. Um, Andrew Little, was, yeah. Andrew Little, thank yeah. you. 
uh, he was able, in the end, looking along his front bench to say, well, there's always Jacinda. And if I'm uh, polling at 25%, you know, yeah. um, there's someone I can pass the baton on to. Well, yeah. with all due respect to Chippy and Michael Wood, um, uh, if I may paraphrase the vice presidential candidate, <laughs> they ain't no Jacinda Ardern. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So, Chris, do we think it was, and I think there was a genuine reaction of shock from within the Labour caucus as well, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So this was driven by the Prime Minister for her reasons, rather than her turning up in Napier and being delivered some sort of ultimatum or some sort of conflict that she felt she couldn't resolve or live with. Yes, I think that's true. But I think what she brought to that meeting in Napier, that retreat, was an understanding, because she's in full, yeah. Jacinda Ardern, that uh, she had moved so far beyond the social license uh, extended by New Zealanders in 2020 that some kind of U-turn was necessary. I'm thinking here particularly of issues like co-governance and yeah. free waters and free speech. Yeah, and she and made so she made a statement just before Christmas as everyone was heading out the door saying, you know, we've got to have essentially the old longing thing, a, couple of, a cup of tea and a breather on things like co-governance. I thought it was remarkably unreported that the Prime Minister yes. appeared to repudiate what had been a central plan. Which brings me to the question, an interesting point, Chris, only Nanaya Mahuta has openly said she will contest the leadership. Was this perhaps the result of, you know, the rubber hitting the road in terms of that large Māori caucus asserting its right to continue with certain widely unpopular policies in an election year? Well, that ranks as the most likely uh, obstacle facing uh, the Prime Minister as she went into an election year. Um, a journalist, Henry Cook, has written a very, very interesting piece analysing um, the results of the latest New Zealand election study, which takes place after every general election. He has analysed the figures emerging from the 2020 um, huge surveys that are conducted of electors by the academics involved. And he drew a picture of the floating voter, uh, the, the pivotal uh, voters in the electorate who may well decide the outcome of this election. And what was very clear was that treaty issues emerged uh, as a determinative issue by a country mile, I mean, well ahead of even things like cost of living. Yeah. So if, if Henry Cook is able to do that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Jacinda Ardern and her in a circle uh, are able to do that. Mm. And, and what I think has happened over the Christmas period is that a realization has sunk in that not only um, have they got well ahead of the electorate on this issue, yeah. but, that, but that if they proceed with it, it is only going to get worse. Now, from Jacinda Ardern's perspective, that is important for two reasons. The first is that Labour, I don't believe, can win with this. I remember Nick Smith after the local government election. Uh, he had just been elected mayor of Nelson, saying that if they proceed with three waters, they are a government with a death wish. And, you know, he's been around a long time, and he, I think he reads the runes pretty accurately. I think she came to a similar conclusion, but as you say, she is up against 15, 16 uh, members of the Māori caucus who seem to be rock solid on this. Um, I don't think she had the stomach, A, for the sort of battle that she would have to fight um, within her own caucus to turn things around, 
But secondly, and I think this is really an important consideration, she has been under such unrelenting pressure from her enemies. And in this day and age, that includes things like death threats, not only to her, but to her family. Um, yeah. Just the unrelenting um, psychological... Yeah, I wanted to get into this. So you are telling me that you think the trolls can claim victory here, that Sam Neill's right when he says it was the awful online misogyny? Or do you think Look, it was a I, factor? I think it was a factor. I don't think it is the factor, but I think it is a factor. And I think it 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 would be churlish to discount it. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you will have experienced oh, it. I have, I have and experienced actually, this. I spent some time reflecting on this literally over the break. In that, it, and, and I feel the psychological pressure of it. I, I basically went non-digital for a couple of weeks to get away from it. And I, yeah. I, and I yeah. had some conversations with people, strangely enough, in Tairua, with the Prime Minister holidays, and I said, God, if I find it tough, um, what she gets is 100,000 times more, exactly. more than I do. Exactly. And also it seemed to me that post the February protests, and I would say the anti-vax or the virulent anti-vaxxers, are the most effective and vicious trolls uh, abroad in New Zealand at present, she certainly became the focus for them. Yes, that's right. So although it's not the factor, I think she looked ahead and said to herself, my God, if, if I have to save the Labour Party by actually executing some kind of uh, exit from the policies that are driving us um, towards defeat. I'm, I'm going to have a terrible time within my own caucus, within my own cabinet. That's bad enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to come under further pressure from outside, from social media, uh, from my own side. But by the same token, um, if, I, if I don't do this, if I press ahead, uh, with the policies, then the volume of, uh, uh, of of hateful noise is just going to go up and up and up. And you know, I I I feel sorry for Jacinda in terms of of how she must have considered alternative strategies. One alternative strategy for Labour would simply to uh, be to re-embrace the old verities of the Labour Party yeah, and, and yeah. that, that always comes down to tax of course that is always the question but she's painted herself into a corner on that because um, she has said effectively no new taxes she has absolutely guaranteed no capital gains tax no wealth tax while she is Prime Minister uh, so she had blocked even that exit. I mean, it's there, I think, for people like Michael Wood. I don't think um, yeah. uh, uh, Chippy would be all that interested, yeah. um, Chris Hipkins, because he's to the right of the party. But it wasn't there for her, not not without her absolute really repudiating yeah. Yeah. the firm promise she had given. Uh. So she's looking around, and every alternative is a bad one. Yeah. Um, and when every alternative is a bad one, um, in a democracy at least, uh, where, as Winston Churchill said, we get to die many times, um, there was really nowhere to go except out of the game, which, yeah. is, which is what she's done. Chris, you have absolutely confirmed uh, my editorial decision to have you the first commentator up this morning. That's pretty. Would you? Would you? Would you, would you hang on? I want to bring Bomber Bradbury in. Would you hang on and and we'll just get a three way conversation going? Is that that good with you? I'm quite happy. All right. Okay. okay. Let's go. We can we get Bomber up? Bomber. Joy, how are Bomber, you? Joy. Uh, have you? Uh, I mean, have you recovered? You, you must be an absolute no, morning, mate. No, I was. I bawled my eyes out. I cried. I dreamt in black and white. It's a terrible day. It's a terrible day of mourning. It's a terrible day of sadness, okay. uh, I think, for the political left with who's standing down. Okay, enough of the sarcasm. Um, 
Do you agree with Chris's, I think, really interesting analysis that this isn't about a bad summer holiday? This is about a, a bigger tension and perhaps a tension with the Maori caucus that Jacinda Ardern on balance said, I'm better off out of here. Um, look, I think that it's an element. Uh, I, how we're going to divvy that up, I'm not sure. My understanding was that the Prime Minister's face, uh, uh, th th there had been some rumours uh, before Christmas that the Prime Minister was looking at her future uh, moving forward, and that was taken universally within those circles uh, to mean that she was thinking about stepping down after the election, which is, which is a position that she has already articulated in public. So I think that when the news came out that she was stepping down effective immediately, it was a shell shock, and it's caught uh, the caucus and the cabinet uh, and the electorate off guard. Um, my understanding was that one of the things that really compounded it for the Prime Minister was finding out that she was not going to be able to do the Waitangi breakfast this year and that there were security concerns. Um, I think that there was a real sense of burnout in her and I think that it really was. She just had nothing left in the tank. Now, in terms of the... Well, um, if, the, if, the, if, the if, if they were going to be politically correct, she had no charge left in the battery. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah let's, let, let's, let's go with that. Um, in, in, terms, in terms of the um, political tensions within Māoridom, look, the Labour Party and caucus thought that they had, by using um, national and act uh, co-governance models, that they had come up with a graceful solution in all of this that gave Māori an acknowledgement of their water interests while rebuilding the, the infrastructure. Um, they thought that they had done this well, and I think that Chris is right. The reality of having to sort of wind back any of those policies, because they are so toxic now, um, was going to be, I think, beyond her uh, political skills. Um, I think that you had two kinds of Jacinda, one who shone in crises. Uh, I mean, New Zealand is always an emotionally stunted country. She was able to have the emotional intelligence to read the room at times when the country really needed navigation on big issues. But then there was the cautious domestic Jacinda, who was never able to get the really transformational promises that she gave the electorate in 2017. They didn't expect to win the 2017 election, so they had no 100-day implementation uh, project, and they didn't expect to win an MEP majority. So her legacy, I think, will be symbolic for, for many. Uh, it was interesting, the, 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 um, the stats that Chris was talking about on Henry Cook's swing voter. What's interesting there is the majority of them are older women, tertiary educated. And the question mark, I think, is for a lot of that swing vote, they will see the way Jacinda has been ripped to pieces and, and vilified on social media. And I think there will be a political backlash to that. Well, what will a political backlash? I was thinking too. Um, really, uh, we will get back probably, and we can talk about this a little bit further. Uh, no female leader of a major political party in New Zealand. We're pretty much back to white blokes, aren't we? Well, I mean, I think that that, that will be the uh, outcome. I think it's likely to be Chris Hipkins and Curry as the uh, deputy. Uh, the backlash, I think, amongst those swing older female voters will be they will uh, support Labour. They will come back home and stay there because they will see the way that Jacinda was vilified as, as something a tactic that shouldn't be rewarded politically. Yeah. Uh, Chris, we can talk a little bit about legacy, uh, and I, I think it is quite soon to be trying to contextualise the Prime Ministership or the leadership of Jacinda Ardern. But I can't help getting a feeling of ennui. Gosh, you get a, a full majority under MMP. It was never meant to happen. And I can't help feeling that on core labour issues like social justice and equity and child poverty and housing affordability. This has been a disappointment. Oh, there's no question that Labour has failed to meet the targets it set itself. Uh, I mean, most notably, of course, the lamentable 
um, Kiwi Build um, project, which promised 100,000 affordable homes and built, I think, less than 2,000 over a period of, of five years. Uh, but I think, I think the legacy of, of Jacinda Ardern um, is going to be an unusual one. In many ways, I think it, it will be a similar legacy to that of Norman Kirk, uh, who, of course, was Prime Minister for, a, for an agonizingly short time, only really a couple of years. And what people remember about Norman Kirk was the enormous sense of possibility, um, the potential for real change after a very long period, 12 years um, of National Party rule. And I was thinking about this uh, yesterday um, and overnight and, and just recalling my own response as a, as a young person, 16, 17 years old, to that event back in 1972. And my response to, to Jacinda in, in 2017. And there was very much that similar sense of um, possibility. And, and she played to that. Um, she did the precise opposite of, of what Helen Clark had no doubt uh, tried to drum into her, uh, which was always to under-promise and over-deliver. Well, I think it's fair to say that, that Jacinda wildly over-promised and, and lamentably under-delivered. Good, but, good line. But, but yeah, but, but even so... She was a young woman. She was part of that next generation. She wasn't part of the baby boom generation. She spoke of kindness. She spoke of transformation. And at least in its early stages, her government or the, the coalition government with Winston um, did, did seem to have that, that potential. Um, and then, of course, came the crises. And, and uh, Martin is absolutely right. Uh, her, her, her instinctive uh, response to those was flawless. And I've always said this, that when Jacinda Ardern allows herself to be led by her heart, you can't beat her. It's when she begins to rely on her head or the head of those around her, heads of those around her, that the decisions become uh, less and less uh, advantageous yeah. uh, to labor and 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 everyone but that that sense of possibility that sort of sense of the sun coming out from behind the clouds which happened in 72 happened again in 2017 and the way the country thanked her in 2020 and that's what the country did i mean when seats like rangatata yeah, or, that's right. It was an amazing election. Yeah, There's no doubt about yeah, that. It, it, it was. Um, and that doesn't happen very often. New Zealanders, as, as Martin said, are a taciturn bunch. Yeah. And uh, they, 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 they don't say thank you to their politicians very often. But they did on that occasion. <laughs> that occasion yeah. um, hey, let, and, uh, and yeah. it's, a, it's amazing uh, to think back uh, mm. to that. Yeah. Not least because... Um, in a sense, she has fallen so far since that amazing yeah. evening. Let's look forward, guys. Martin, um, Nanaya Mahuta, uh, I think, rather ham-fistedly says she's going to stand, which I think talks to the speculation uh, Chris has raised about whether or not there was some Māori caucus issue or a power play in caucus behind this. But who do we think will uh, prevail on Sunday. Will someone prevail on Sunday? Will someone get two thirds? I think they have to uh, for Labour to get out of this and with any sort of skerrick of dignity. Um, and what does the new leader do to try and stem the bleeding, Martin? It's interesting. Over the last sort of uh, eight weeks, I suppose, you'll see a lot of uh, of the woke activists online. Uh, suddenly waking up to what an act party government policy looks like. And I think they've spent the last two years deplatforming people for not speaking or pronouncing enough te reo or misusing pronouns, and they've been on such a busy purge internally, 
everyone's forgotten what act and national represent and what that policy platform would mean to progressive voters. And I think that what's going on behind the scenes right now is a sudden wake-up call of just how far right an act national government would go maybe for the first time in, in 30 years of MMP. And that is really shocking everyone straight into putting together the best team possible to try and stop that juggernaut. And uh, I think that in terms of where the numbers are falling at the moment, I, I think um, Chris Hipkins will take the leadership and I think Kerry Allen will be his deputy. In terms of the policies, well, I mean, you know, the identity politics has become such a powerful culture war determinant and it has had such an impact. I think that we're seeing uh, much worse economic indicators coming on. This will soon, the economic recession will soon start feeling like a crisis. And I think the government, whatever function it's going to be, is going to have to argue how much capacity the state is going to need to have to tackle these problems, or are we going to prune the state back even further? If Chris Hipkins and Kerry Allen are able to articulate a state that is going to subsidise your base costs, be it you know, free dental, uh, be it public transport, be it um, food in schools, something that's going to have an immediate impact on people's bottom line, particularly when you're seeing, what, 11.4% food inflation this week. The economic issues of 2023 are going to be the dominant one, and whoever can promise the electorate an actual target that can be met on material, so economic justice, not social justice, because that's a minefield, if they're able to articulate that, they're in the game. Do they also need to scrap uh, co-governance in three waters? Oh, I, 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 think, I think that, the, again, the reality of an act national government, whatever, is, 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 whatever, whatever stops that from happening has got to be considered. And I think that the, the, there is going to have to be some reanalysis of co-governance in three waters. Wow. Okay. Chris, do you think Hipkins, Kerry Allen, the most likely outcome Sunday? I think it'll be uh, Chris Hipkins, um, and Kerry Allen would be a sensible choice uh, because uh, Labour, I think, would be keen to have a woman um, and um, a Maori uh, in the top two. Um, I think, however, if it is Chris Hipkins, there's a problem for Labour. Uh, Grant Robertson, Jacinda Ardern, and Chris Hipkins were that really crucial trio uh, which uh, soldiered on through Phil Goff, through David Shearer, through David Cunliffe to emerge <laughs> um, at the top of the Labour Party. They, they were all the, the protégés of, of Helen Clark and, and, and Michael Cullen. So there was, there was a measure of continuity there. Um, but that is a bit of a problem, it seems to me. The fact that Grant said he wasn't in the running tells me something. It tells me that he is absolutely determined and will make it very, very clear to his colleagues that it is vital that he remain as Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. That means that mm -hmm. the essential economic policies of the government will remain in place. I think he will be pushing very hard for Chris Hipkins, who is now really the sole remaining member of the Type 3, um, if mm. I may mangle a rugby analogy. Um, and if that's the case, then if you'll recall what I said before about when Jacinda relied on the, the heads around her rather than um, the counsel of her own heart, she tended to make the wrong choices. Well, then I suspect the wrong choices will continue to be made. Um, I think he's very new, but I think somebody very new and somebody much more recognizably Labour, uh, i.e. Um, young Michael Wood, uh, is, is the man to go for. Um, but I don't think they will have the courage to do that. Um, I think they will plump for safety. I'm not of the view that, a, that an open uh, election involving the rest of the party would be that bad an idea because mm. I, mm. Think, I think that the debate that is happening 
everywhere else except the Labour Party. Labor Good point. Party. Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is, is one that should be had in front yeah. of the people of New Zealand and resolved one way or the other because mm. what Labour has been for the last five or more years is a debate-free zone. And that is always extremely bad for a political party. Mm. Mm. Hey, mm. guys, I thank you both. That has been a brilliant half hour of political analysis and commentary. And I know that, you know, both of you are left leaners, as it were, um, which is why your views, I think, uh, have more pertinence than someone from the other side uh, putting the boot in or indeed being obsequiously nice about the demise <laughs> of Jacinda Ardern. Um, let's see what happens in the next few weeks. I thank you so much for your time this morning, guys. That is Martin Bomber Bradbury and uh, Chris Trotter. Really good perspectives. A a and look, let's. what's the takeaway from that session? Uh, this probably wasn't about a bad holiday. It was a power struggle over three waters and co-governance, perhaps, with the Māori caucus. And the Prime Minister just decided, well, stuff you then. Um, Chris Hipkins... Most likely uh, new Prime Minister for this country, uh, though maybe, maybe if that tussle with the Māori caucus continues, there will be a wider debate in the Labour Party.